Well, hello, everyone. Glad to be with you. Uh, if we haven't met in person before, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Bethany Church. Um, I'm over at the Kittery Point campus, and um, hopefully someday soon we'll see each other. I keep reminding myself and others that every single day that passes, we're one day closer to being back together. And I, I will tell you that um, I've noticed that um, a lot of people have been commenting on social media about should they cut their own hair and quite honestly, my life has not changed in that realm very much. It's still me as the full-time barber. So I'm sorry for some of the challenge that some of you, some of you guys have to face on that topic. But on a serious note, we are, uh, we're in our second week of a, a series on the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're thinking through and wrestling through the topic of who is the Holy Spirit. And so as we enter in, I want to pray for us. And um, I just ask that you would join me as I pray. Let's do this together. God, our, our prayer that we just place before you is, is that the Holy Spirit would be our guide and our instructor as we delve into your scriptures. Our prayer is that you would awaken and aliven, just bring something new to us in our hearts and our minds. God, I feel like I regularly pray this prayer, but it's a, it's a consistent one that we need, that we wouldn't just learn a little bit more, but that we'd be changed by your word, through the power of your spirit, this very day. So we ask that you would meet us in a beautiful way and instruct us. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So um, in this series on the Holy Spirit, we, we want to figure out something about the person of the Holy Spirit. And I thought to do that, probably a, a good place to start would be by giving us just a core theology of who is the Holy Spirit. And when the Bible talks about God, as you dig into the scriptures more and more, you see that God reveals himself as a Trinitarian God, as one God in three persons. And the way that theologians often talk about this is they say God is one in essence and three in person. One in essence, three in person. So God is one, but he's three distinct person. He is Father, he is Son, and he is Holy Spirit. There's a, a beautiful mystery to this, and yet there is some truth, and actually quite a bit of truth we can glean from the Scripture as we dig into this topic of the Holy Spirit. Now, depending on the circles in which you run, when the words Holy Spirit come up, that may be something that you're very familiar with. There are other churches that don't seem to talk much about the Holy Spirit. But if we want to be biblical, when we dig into the Bible, it becomes very evident that the, the Holy Spirit is one of the person in the Trinity. And when you look at the interaction and the community within the Trinity, you see that the Father is loving the Son, and the Son is loving the Father, and the Spirit is making much of the work of the Son to the glory of the Father. They're all working in this together. But it's important to note that the Spirit of God is not this amorphous thing, but the Spirit of God truly is a person. And so when we talk about him, we don't say it so much as we say he, he, the Holy Spirit. Today, what I want to do is I want to really bring us to two main objectives. I want to open with a key concept, and then at the end of the sermon, I want to land with one key question that, that I hope will encourage and challenge you. And so here's the key concept that I want us to hit on today, which is this. The Holy Spirit has given us truth through the Word. The Holy Spirit has given us truth through the Word. And we're going we're gonna to delve into that going into Scripture. But I think sometimes when we say that the Holy Spirit gives us truth through the Word, our inclination can be to go right to the Bible. But I think we maybe need to slow down a little bit because that could be presumptive. I think maybe first we need to agree on what this word truth actually means. We, we live in a culture right now that is pretty unclear about what truth is. You may have conversations with somebody and they'll say something like, well, I don't really believe there's any truth at all. Which, if you think about it, is highly ironic because that statement that they just made is an assertion of truth. Or you may hear people say, well, that's your truth, but that's not my truth. And so we need to get a grounding on what this word truth even means before we figure out how it relates to the work of the Holy Spirit. So let me give you a definition of the word truth. Truth is a property of assertions that corresponds with reality. Let me say it again. Truth is a property of assertions 
that corresponds with reality. Now, that's definitely a, a philosophical way of describing this notion of truth. So let me take it from kind of the philosophical to the practical level. When you say something is true, you're saying it lines up with reality. You're saying what lines up with what is real. So if someone came to me and said, hey, Tim, is it true that you're six feet two inches? And my response was, no, it's not true. I'm five feet one inch. Well, then somebody takes out a tape measure and they measure me and it turns out that I'm six feet two. You would say that what I was saying about being five foot one is not true. And that the truth is that I'm six foot two. So you understand that when somebody asserts something as true, they're saying this lines up with what is real. This lines up with reality. And when we think about this concept of truth, you, you may say to yourself, well, why is this idea so important? And so what I would say is we are hardwired to want to live according to the truth. There's something in you and me that when falsehood arises somewhere in our lives, it doesn't sit well with us. At a visceral level, we respond and we say, I don't like that. We're hardwired to live according to the truth. Just imagine you go out to a store and you purchase a product that's been advertised to do X. And then when you get it home, it doesn't perform in that area. You don't generally say, well, no big deal. You think to yourself, no, I feel frustrated because the truth that was laid before me was that it could do this, and I see that it can't. And so we see a disconnect, and that brings some angst into our lives. Think about when you're watching your favorite sports team, and a, a catch is made by the opposing team, and on the replay, you can see very clearly that that person was out of bounds, but the referee still calls it a touchdown. We often respond and we say, no, that's not right. How can you give them points for that? It wasn't actually true that he caught the ball and he was in bounds. See, we're, we're hardwired to want to live according to truth. We cry out against things when we see they're not true. Or on the positive side of things, if someone comes to you and says, hey, that's a job well done, it feels good. We appreciate that because we're not just thinking that was a, a kind comment. We're thinking that person actually believes what has been expressed. They actually believe it's true that I did a good job on whatever task was placed before me. You see, we're hardwired to live according to the truth. And what a gift it is that the Holy Spirit has given us truth through the Word. We're going to delve into the scripture in a moment, but let's just pause for a minute. If my assertion, as described and explained in the Bible, if it's true that the Holy Spirit has given us truth through the word, we should just pause and be thankful. We don't have to wander through this life wondering what is the truth. We don't have to wander through this life wondering is there any truth at all. No, God has given us truth through his word so that we can live back to our definition, according to reality, according to what is real. So I want to look at a passage to open up here in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you've got your, uh, your Bible open there, you can turn with me, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and a handful of verses there. Now, whenever we study Scripture, we always remember that the context is very important. And so the context for this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is that the Apostle Paul is writing to this young pastor, this young church leader, Timothy. And he's encouraging him in his leadership. And as he's doing that, he's, he's identifying to Timothy some of the challenges going on in the culture. And then in particular, he notes to Timothy that some other people have infiltrated the church and they're bringing things into his congregation that are not going to help lead the congregation into the life that God desires for them. So 2 Timothy and chapter 3 is this passage, and let's look at some of the descriptors given of the times and of these false teachers. Paul says this, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud and arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. The list continues. Treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And then he says, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into your households, 
And they captured women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Paul's trying to encourage Timothy because these people have come into the midst of what's going on in his local church, and they're starting to lead people astray. And so Paul gives us this list of all these challenges that are going on. But in verse 10, he lands and then he starts to turn the corner after he's listed all the trouble that's happening in the culture, that's happening with these false teachers. He then says to Timothy, I want you to think a little bit differently. In verse 10, he says these first two words. He says, you, however. And so what Paul's going to say there is going to be a contrast to what he's just laid out. You have all this controversy, all this trouble, but you, Timothy, however, I want you to do something different. I want you to live differently than what you see. Timothy, don't be like these men. Timothy, don't be like the cultures. And then Paul says, you have followed my teaching from the scriptures. Notice here that Paul says, here's the trouble, and the answer is to go back to the scriptures. He says, you followed what I've taught you, but it's not just Paul's ideas. The source of his truth, the source of the facts and information he's bringing to Timothy is the scriptures. And then down in verse 16, as he describes the scriptures, he says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul lays out this argument, and it kind of goes like this. Here's the culture, and here's these controversial, te controversial teachers. And I want you to be different, Timothy. I want you to live according to the scriptures that I brought to you. And by the way, Timothy, those scriptures are breathed out by God, and they're effective for many things. He lists some of the benefits of these scriptures. He says that it's good for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. So God has given us, word, us his word to teach us to show us what the truth is. He's given us his word to reprove and help us correct ourselves to move away from sin. He's given us his word to train us in righteousness so that we can be equipped for every good work that is in front of us. We have all the tools we need to live the life God desires for us. Now, if you've been connected to Bethany Church for any amount of time, you know we're a church that is rooted in the Scripture. I just want to share with you one brief experience I had where I saw that come to the forefront even more than I already knew. I saw it in a deeply personal way. Back in, I think it was 2013, I was being ordained to become a pastor here at the church. And Pastor Dirk was heading up my ordination committee. And so what happened was every other week for about an hour and a half or two hours, I would sit down with this committee and they would just grill me with questions. Question after question after question. And what they were looking for was to say, am I handling the word of God accurately? Do I know the word of God enough well to respond to the challenges that will come before me as someone who could be a pastor in this church? You see, we love and value the scripture not just because it's an interesting book, but we believe it's God's truth given to us, and that truth came to us, has power and authority, and it came through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now this passage here again says that, verse 16, all Scripture is breathed out by God. I want you to notice it says the word all. It doesn't say some Scripture. It doesn't say the Scriptures that I like. It doesn't say the scriptures that I can apply to my life pretty effectively, but avoid the other ones. It says all of scripture is breathed out by God. And we've already talked about what it's effective to do. This language of breathed out scripture takes us back to the book of Genesis. It takes us back to this idea that the, the Spirit of God is hovering over the darkness. And the Spirit of God represents this life and this vitality and this essence. And when the first human beings are made— Life is breathed into them. The, the Greek word that you would use for this would be pneumos, and in particular, this word is theonustos, which is the only time it's used in Scripture, that God has breathed out something in this way, and it's into the Scriptures and the authority of Scripture there. So God has breathed his authority into this word so that we can actually walk according to his direction. I wrote down here, we have been given a book by God that's been breathed out by God. The very Spirit of God worked through human authors, authors to bring us this powerful word of God. We have a Holy Spirit made 
power-filled Word of God. And it doesn't just tell us 10 ways to have a better life. It tells us what is true. It tells us what is real and what is not real. And one of the challenges and the beautiful things about Scripture is that when you study it, it brings before you the assertion of what ultimately is, and it makes us say, well then, if it's not here, if it's not affirmed by the Scripture, then it's not ultimately real. Years ago, I was leading a, a small Bible study of some young adults, and we were digging into some of the foundations of the Christian faith. As we did that, one of the things that, that came out was we were studying in John chapter 11 where Jesus' friend Lazarus dies. And as Jesus is interacting with the sisters of Lazarus, at one point, he's in this interaction, and the question comes up of, do you think that I can bring, essentially, Lazarus back to life? And the sister responds, that I know at the end of all things that there will be this resurrection. And then Jesus' response is, I am the resurrection. And he goes on to say that, Anyone who believes and trusts in him, though they die, they will live. And then he says, and those who believe in me shall never die. If God's word is truth, and the Spirit has empowered this word to be given to us, if God's word is truth, that means that for followers of Jesus, there is a way in which we can think about our existence and say we will never die. God's word has proclaimed it, and so it's true. The Spirit of God has breathed out truth, and through human authors, as they wrote it down, he's given us that truth in his word. If you're someone who likes to take notes or do some additional study, I want to send you over to 2 Peter chapter 1 later on so that you can dig into the scripture that talks about how God, by the Spirit, carries along the authors as they write down God's truth that you and I have today. We have a book that was breathed out by the Spirit who is God. The Holy Spirit has given us truth through the Word, and that's in the Scripture. But it's not just in the Scripture that we see this come to life. If you have your Bible, you can turn over to the Gospel of John in chapter 1. It's a really interesting passage because as you start to read it, you'll see that this idea of the Word is not abstract and distant. It actually comes to life in a very real way. Listen to these words from the Gospel of John in chapter 1 in the first verse. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, John could have easily written, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a friend of God, or the Word knew about God. But John asserts here, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's something significant about the Word being God. If you jump down to ver ver verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, the Word of God is, yes, this written Word that the Holy Spirit has given to us, but not long into the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus Christ himself is called the Word of God made flesh. And in the same way that the Spirit of God, by power and authority, brings us this written Word, the Spirit of God anointed and empowered Jesus for his earthly ministry. We have the word in written form, and we have the word made flesh, and that's Jesus. When you follow the life of Jesus, you'll see that at the beginning of his earthly ministry, when he starts to travel and preach and teach, he goes to John the Baptist to be baptized. In Matthew chapter 3, that story is told, and when John is there with Jesus and he baptizes him, something beautiful happens that's a picture of this authority given by the Spirit of God to Jesus to send him out into his ministry. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, and then it says this, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven This said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, God could have given us just the Word in this written book, but he also gave us the Word made flesh. And in both those cases, the Spirit of God is empowering this Word and the Word made flesh. And now we have been given that gift so that we can know him and walk out our lives according to truth. 
how faithful he's been to us in so many ways. This idea, this picture you see in Matthew is, is basically an anointing of God upon Jesus via the Holy Spirit so he can begin his earthly ministry. And if you go through the, the scriptures, you'll see this idea of anointing is when someone is being conferred authority and giving a blessing as they enter into a new stage of life. You see this happen with Samuel toward David with the promise that one day David will become the future king. You even read it in Psalm 23, this idea that the Lord anoints my head with oil. There's a blessing that's conferred there. And so the Spirit of God is anointing Jesus so he can go out and engage in his earthly ministry. And Jesus doesn't just think about the word of truth. He doesn't just talk about the word of truth. But the Spirit of God empowers Jesus to go out and to to be this earthly ministry to all those around him because Jesus is the truth. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Later on in the Gospel of John, in chapter 18, Jesus hits on this notion. Listen to these words. He says, For this purpose I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And so what can we conclude the Holy Spirit's relationship is to truth and to the word? Here's what we have. The Holy Spirit has given us truth through the word, the Bible. The Holy Spirit has given us truth through the word, the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And once again, I would just encourage you to pause and to offer thanks to God that we're not wandering through the oceans of life without a rudder. We have something to steer us and to direct us, and that is the truth of God given to us in the Word. Now, when you think about this, you may say to yourself, perhaps this is the first time you've really taken a dive into thinking about the topic of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never heard that the Holy Spirit is the one who, who brought us the Word. Maybe that's new to you. Maybe as you, you hear these words, you think that the, the information is familiar, but it still feels like it's at a distance. So I said when I started, I wanted to give you a key concept, which is that the Holy Spirit brings us truth through the Word. But I also said I want to ask you one key question. Here's that question. What truth is informing how you live your life? What truth is informing how you live your life. Now, as I ask you that, you may hear that and say to yourself, I have no idea. I just kind of, whatever the, the emotion is or the experience is or the culture, whatever the culture says, whatever relationship I'm in, that's the thing that's, that's driving me. What well, God wants to give you the gift of the Spirit who has given you the Word so that you can live according to truth. Maybe when you hear that question, you think, I know exactly what truth is driving my life, and that truth is that I'm the captain of my own ship. I make the decisions. I go where I want to go because I'm the boss. But God wants to give you truth so that you can be freed from having to be the one in charge and let the creator of the universe be your guide. Maybe when you hear those words, you think, no, no, I, I live according to this spirit-given word of truth, but but right now I'm in a season where I've kind of gone a little bit astray, and maybe it's, maybe it's the truth of fear. Maybe it's the truth of wanting to be in control. Maybe it's the truth of authority or power. Maybe it's the truth of just if I had this one relationship, I think everything would be right. Whatever it is, God wants to have the truth that drives your life be his word because it's empowered and given to us by the very Holy Spirit of God. What a gift he's given us, again, that we don't have to wander around, but he wants us to live according to truth, according to reality. Let me close just by saying this. This book given to us by the Spirit of God will lead you to flourishing. Sometimes when we look at the Bible, we consider it a, a rule book, but if the Spirit of God has given us this book and it's going to empower us to live according to God's direction, then the only outcome is goodness. 
Not always as we think or expect, but the only outcome is goodness. If we will walk according to this truth. So do that. Find joy and life as you live according to his truth. Let me pray. God, we just confess to you that walking out your Holy Spirit-given truth that we see in this book and modeling our lives after the Word made flesh, the truth brought to life, Jesus Christ, that's hard to do. And so we ask that you would encourage us. We ask that you'd give us courage to turn from things that are not true and to live according to the truth. We ask that even in this moment of being separated from one another physically, that you'd send people into our lives to bless us, to encourage us, to give us words of affirmation so that we could, we could walk this life out that you, you've laid before us. God, if your Holy Spirit has given us truth in this scripture, if your Holy Spirit empowered Jesus for his earthly ministry, then we do well to abide by it. So give us the ability to do so a little bit more today and tomorrow and the next day to the glory of your name and for the joy of our own hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.